Welcome to Hedge Fund Tips with Tom Hayes. I'm Tom Hayes, and this is our 108th video cast and our 98th podcast for the week ending November 11th, 2021. We'll kick it off with some quick media spots and then get right down to it. We've got a lot of Ask Me Anything questions this week, which are always great, and uh, and quite a bit to cover on China. So, uh, first, want to thank uh, last week Devik Jain and Bansari Moyur for having me in their Reuters article. Uh, this related to the Pfizer pill that came out, uh, the antiviral. We couldn't get any more positive news. Market was up a lot prior to this with the Pfizer news, but now it feels like it's really the end of the pandemic, uh, which uh, Scott Gottlieb said in so many words that morning. It's a quick, efficacious solution. If you get diagnosed, you take the pill and you're back in action. So the market loves it. The travel and leisure set, uh, sector loves it. And we love it. Uh, then um, uh, this was a follow on. So that's the second article also from Bansari Kamdar. Um, and then moving on to this week. Uh, yesterday, the market was down on the inflation fears. I said that it's just a natural breather. The markets moved quite a bit in a short period of time off the September lows. Wednesday's losses, da 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 factory, factory gate. Okay, so that was a short quote. Quote of the day for the theme of this call is from Charlie Munger. He says, a lot of people with high IQs are terrible investors because they've got terrible temperaments. And what's he talking about temperaments? He's talking about... Uh, very short-term mindset, impatience, not knowing what you own, chasing what's up, uh, following the crowds, all of those type of factors that uh, lead to underperformance over time. Uh, so, so that's the context of this call. Uh, first question of the week for Ask Me Anything uh, was actually posted on YouTube under last week's video from Kash Ganja. Uh, thanks for the great tips with the Glasgow Climate Summit and the world aiming to lower CO2. How's the stock market going to react on this short term and long term? Uh, yeah, that, that's a that's a really interesting question. Um, you know, it, it leads me, to, you know, it, in many regards, it may be a factor in the fact that uh, President Biden invited Lael Brainerd to be interviewed to take over as the chairman of the Fed. Um, Jay Powell was also interviewed this week, so it's not to say that Lil Brainerd is definitely going to do that. But uh, in the context of uh, intent for the transition over time, in the short term, that can have slowing effects on the economy. I mean, we're seeing it in energy prices. Uh, stopping drilling on federal lands, we didn't have these supply problems uh, prior to the pandemic. Uh, there's no question about it. If anything, we had the other problem. We were creating a glut of oil because you could drill basically any anywhere under the previous administration. So it could have a slowing effect in the short term. But uh, the powers that be are really behind this. And I've, I've read in numerous research reports that the spend on this over time uh, it could be $5 trillion a year. So uh, Morgan Stanley actually put out a note uh, that was covered in Barron's just a few, three days ago ahead of this uh, COP26 meeting. And they basically lay out the case for uh, sustainable investing. And then they focus in on those sectors which will benefit it. And it may surprise you um, they talk about the renewable sector and they list a bunch of names, a bunch of Chinese names, also Sunrun and First Energy in the U.S. Uh, for energy storage, they're talking about Panasonic uh, and QuantumScape. Uh, for hydrogen, a bunch of Chinese companies and foreign companies and then New Fortress Energy, Enbridge, uh, which is a U.S. Uh, pipeline company, Air Products. Uh, which is a U.S. company, and then bets in sustainable alternative fuels include major oil companies, ExxonMobil, Chevron, Holly Frontier is a refiner, Marathon Petroleum, and developing field of carbon capture utilization and storage uh, would be Bayer, that's a German company, uh, ConocoPhillips, Next Decade, and Occidental Petroleum, uh, electric transport, obviously Tesla, Neo, Lee, um, 
uh, and, and they also put in a couple of ones you wouldn't expect, a trucking company called Night Swift, uh, and renovation and energy efficiency. These are foreign companies. And then um, bearish on some of the utilities and some of the airlines. So you can read this note go to barons just put in following cop 26 question mark look at these three sustainable investing strategies and 40 stock picks um by and large i think it's about a third of the s p 500 100 has their carbon neutral plans already out so with the amount of money that's being forced into these esg products and and the and the uh sellers of these products like BlackRock are doing a great job promoting them. Why? Because they get higher fees on them. Uh, there have been critical articles calling it greenwashing, that they're not really green products, but they get to charge higher fees because they put the ESG wrapper on it. And I think that's going to be widespread and you can just expect it and look for it. But the fact of the matter is by the, you know, in five years, the S&P index is going to be a, an ESG product because 100% of them will have plans to get to uh, you know net zero by 2040 or 2050 or 2060 depending what industry they're in uh, so the net effect is um, uh, it it could slow down growth in the shorter term if they move too quickly but if they move over uh, at a reasonable pace over time because this is you know the cat's out of the bag that the genie's not going back in the bottle this is this is the direction that uh, uh, we're going um, it, it could be a net positive and it'll create a lot of jobs it'll create a lot of new industries there'll be a lot like you saw in the 20s thousands of car companies that went bankrupt uh, the, the hard thing is going to be picking the new winners so what 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 I want to do is look in the context of established companies that can make themselves green, meaning they have stable cash flows, they have a uh, history of earnings power, and they're moving in the direction where they're going to get that anointed label of being green or ESG friendly. So I don't have to take the risk of seeing around the corner and seeing which of these are going to live and which are going to die because... Uh, uh that that's uh it's very tough i mean unless you you buy a basket you expect you know 80 percent of them to go bankrupt and 20 percent to win um you, you just have to be careful on that on that front but uh uh that that's kind of how i'm thinking about it kashkanja so thank you for that question um ben first name only uh podcast question please what do you expect for oil oil stocks and financial short term. I, I think Ben asked this question literally every single week, and my answer every single week is the same. Uh, they've had a huge move off of last year. We were buyers of them last year. We're holders of them now. We like them into we like them long term over the next three to five years. But to put a ton of new money to work in these after they're up 150 percent, 125 percent, let them rest. And that's basically what they've been doing. Uh, financials, I think that we're going to talk a lot about uh, rates and the yield curve this week. I think you could be selective in financials. We still have a big holding in Wells Fargo. Uh, I, I think that's got some room to run. There can be some positive catalysts in that name. But uh, again, you know, these two groups have already moved. We want to talk about what's what's going next uh, and um and focus there where you can make big money, not not day to day gyrations. Is XOP or XLE going to move two dollars or up or down in the next three days? We could care less. But um, so uh, my my quick answer, because you took the time to write the question, is um, you know I I would um, you know if you're going to be in energy, I think there's still some opportunity in refiners and some of the midstream players. Uh, the exploration and production have moved up a lot. I'd be waiting for a pullback, whether that's catalyzed by Iran uh, or something else or, or builds like we saw this week. Um, I wouldn't be, I, I just wouldn't be chasing them up here. Could they go higher? Yeah. Do we have a lot of energy? Yeah. Uh, but putting new money to work for either of these groups, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're just so many other things that are still really really beaten down so yes we love them both over the next three to five years we do think rates are generally going up um 
Um, but uh, but there, there are better places for new money in our view. Uh, okay, next Ask Me Anything question comes from... Uh, Mikhail Bobkoff. Um, Mikhail says, Hi, Tom. Hope you're doing well and would be very happy if you could answer my two questions. If one of your, in one of your previous podcasts, you went through price to free cash flow as your starting metric to screening stocks. I noticed many other investors also prefer using free cash flow over earnings. Could you expl please explain why free cash flow or cash flow in general is better compared to accounting earnings? Secondly, a while back, you mentioned that U.S. government bonds could peak around when the taper would be implemented. Do you think there's still a possibility for yields to rise? Uh, thank you, as always, for providing such educational and great podcast. Kind regards, Mikhail Bobkoff. So thank you, Mikhail. Um, you know, both earnings and cash flow are very important. But the reason that if we have to use a fundamental screen, which we don't often use, but if, if you have to peg us to one, that would be a good starting point. <laughs> and it works better for uh, certain industries than others, you know, like uh, financials, you don't really want to use price to free cash flow, it can be uh, uh, misleading, like banks, I like to use price to book, to tangible book. Um, other companies, you know, there are a lot of tech companies that don't have earnings, although we don't tend to traffic in those. But my general view is if you're trying to anticipate shorter term moves inside a year, earnings matter more. If you're looking at it from a longer term perspective, one to five years, uh, you want to look at free cash flow. Why? Because that's what they use to return cash capital to owners, uh, which is cash, not accounting uh, profits. They, they return cash through buybacks and in some cases through dividends. And the more cash that they have, the more options they have in terms of they can they can grow through acquisition, they can buy back stock, they can issue dividends. Um, if you look at some of the uh, scholastic periodicals about portfolio management, uh, generally as a factor, uh, free cash flow relative to share price tends to outperform over time. Uh, if, if you do the research relative to a, an earnings multiple, it's uh, uh, harder to manipulate. And um, more cash flow, you know, as I said, gives you the opportunity to do those acquisitions, return capital to shareholders. Uh, and the reason it's not probably widely uh, implemented and you don't hear about it a lot is because the trickiness of applying it. So some complications are what to do when cash flow is negative or whether to use cash flow, free cash flow or leverage free cash flow. Um, so so that that gums it up a little bit. Um, and, uh, you know, so, so that's really why. And then a lot of people aren't, you know, value investors. You know, a lot of growth investors can never use price to free cash flow because they don't have any cash flow. Uh, they're betting on a new technology and they're they're metric is a total addressable market. So they come up with a fantasy number and a projection and they get a lot of people to buy into it. And you're going to see a ton of that with the greenwashing and with, with the ESG in, you know, coming years and decades, uh, that's going to be the game as well. So, but we're going to stick to uh, companies that return cash and slow and steady. And when they get dislocated, we lean into them. Uh, and then we wait a, a year or two for them to uh, return back to trend and usually double. And then we rinse and repeat and do it all over again. So um, so great question on that front, Mikkel. Next question comes from Matt Mitchell. Uh, hi, Tom. Per your recommendation in the University of Bristol uh, video cast, I've been making my way through uh, Warren Buffett's annual Berkshire letters while rereading The Intelligent Investor. One of the many... Aspect that struck me so far in the letters is Buffett saying that his favorite holding period for a company is forever. In his 1989 letter, he says, we will keep most of our major holdings regardless of how they are priced relative to intrinsic business value, such as their holdings at the time of Geico, Washington Post, or Coke. Do you take a similar approach to Buffett by having some core holdings that you don't sell regardless of their price? Uh, 
No Berkshire exited the Washington Post parent a few years back, but assuming the business outlook for a company is still robust. Thanks and keep up the great work. Uh, yeah, so I would say a couple of things about that. Um, first and foremost, what you have to keep in mind with Warren Buffett is he has permanent capital. The, the number one thing that Warren Buffett figured out was not how to be a better, better stock picker than the rest of the world. Uh, what he figured out, because there are people who have better returns than him. I mean, if you look at Icon's returns, um, obviously those Renmac, Renaissance guys, the, the uh, high frequency guys, uh, there, there are a handful of even value guys that have better longer term track records, uh, partially because the law of large numbers hurt Buffett over time and partially because it didn't really matter because the key for Buffett was writing insurance when the loss ratios favored and not writing insurance when they didn't, whereas most insurance companies have to write regardless of the environment. They just keep keep writing policies. So what he figured out was if he could get costless capital or even get paid to hold people's money uh, when you have positive loss ratios, then if he just put that, th that insurance float in equities, uh, a larger portion than his peers across the industry, which was predominantly fixed income, uh, he would outperform over time. And that's exactly what happened. So for him, there's no incentive to be in and out of stocks. All he has to do is meet a bogey, which, you know, his peers is three to five percent. And if he's in effectively blue chip company, he's going to make six, seven, eight percent. And he doesn't even have to think about it. And that's exactly what he's done. And, and you know the story with Coke, how the dividends have compounded and uh, Geico and, and everything else. So um, so there's a value to holding period forever. Uh, when you don't have permanent capital, uh, when you have outside investors to answer to, you know, th they want to see returns over a reasonable period of time. You know, they'll give you a couple years, uh, but, you know, at the end of uh, two years, two and a half years, you 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 have to have meaningfully outperformed the S&P 500 uh, net of fees or they're not going to stick around with you. Um, so in that context, what, what you're doing is you're buying stocks and companies when they're dislocated and out of favor and then once they get back to fair value or or overvalued you're, you're taking those positions off so you can realize those gains and recycle it back into companies that look undervalued again uh, they build their base you add to it they they double you you take them off and and you rinse and repeat so so that's a different game as far as what i do in with um, my money that's not invested alongside with clients uh, you know, you can have, if you have like, um, the number one thing you would want to hold uh, and not, not sell is a basket of American business. And, and Buffett talks about this uh, all the time. You know, if you uh, hold an ETF, it's very tax efficient. If you hold an ETF that mimics the S&P 500, whether it's the SPY or others that do it uh, at low cost, you would never want to sell that. Uh Ever because you know over time that's going to compound depending on the decade you know seven eight percent uh, you get dividends you can reinvest those dividends and you know you're going to double your money basically every ten years in some decades you'll double your money in seven years in some some periods you'll double your money in twelve years but it's a snowball and um, and that that's a bet where you never want to buy and sell the other thing is if you're taxable. You want to have a holding period forever. So, you know, maybe there are a few companies like Coca-Cola or Berkshire Hathaway or some of those companies, Procter & Gamble, where you don't even think about it uh, and you want to hold those forever. But basically, if you own the S&P 500, uh, that would be something that you'd want to have a holding period forever uh, and not trade in and out of for for primarily uh, tax reasons. You know, you, you want that to compound uninterrupted and unimpaired for as long as possible and uh, the ETF tax wrapper has basically uh, created an unbelievable opportunity to do that. It's, it's basically, other than paying the taxes on dividends, it's basically like having an unlimited size IRA. And, you know, if you need money, you can borrow against it. You don't have to sell it. Um, although that will change as rates go up. I think there's going to be a lot less borrowing against securities because security prices will go down and borrowing costs will go up and uh, you'll have kind of a, a negative, uh, like a reverse mortgage thing where uh, it, it just creates a negative feedback loop. But uh, for now, 
that that is a good setup. So so I would say obviously Buffett's right, but he's speaking from a different context of his capital base and how he's incentivized uh, uh, versus other managers and or your own personal money. So I hope I've I've clarified that. Um, in taxable accounts, you definitely want to try to just hold the S and P uh, in an ETF. That's and just add to it whenever you get money. Don't worry about timing. Just you know, ideally, if you're doing it regularly on a monthly basis, and just never sell it. Pay the taxes on the dividends as you have to, uh, and and let that compound for you. Uh, okay, Dan sent an e sent an email. He said, "Just a thought. Keep in mind when looking at historical inflation, and the calculations have changed over time, and there's a significant sh shadow inflation." I would say this, um, you know, and I looked up, uh, Dan has a, um, a uh, number one, it's a good point. So I appreciate him sending it to us. Number two, his email address ends in .ar, which is Argentina. So he has a completely different relationship to inflation than we do. Uh, and that's understandably so. Um, what I would say is the shadow stats information is certainly valuable. Uh, but, uh, you know, when QE1, QE2, and QE3 was going on after the last crisis, you know, these were the kind of cadre of, of folks who were, you know, screaming at the moon that hyperinflation was coming, get your wheelbarrows, get your guns, gold, and, and get your uh, bomb shelter and as much canned food as possible. And uh, their predictions never came to pass, shadow inflation or not. Uh, we we fought deflation for about 10 years. The reason we fought deflation is uh, the expansion of money supply was offset by um, contraction of money supply, meaning um, debt write downs. So there was a tremendous amount of default and a tremendous amount of write downs of debt, which which contracted money supply over the last cycle. We're not having that this cycle so so the setup this cycle is is better for people who want to uh, promote hyperinflation uh, but we're going to go through a number of reasons why we don't think that's going to happen we do think we're going to have above trend inflation and we actually are going to lay out the case to why that might be positive uh, but we don't think we're going to get runaway inflation and we don't think we're going to get hyperinflation despite all the recent headlines so um but you could definitely check out what he's referencing. Uh, shadowstats.com is what he's talking about. And they're, they're just making the case that there's more inflation than, um, than our, our traditional metrics uh, lead us to believe and that they've changed the metrics in, in the early 80s, et cetera, et cetera. Um, an old friend, Jeff White, uh, writes to me on LinkedIn. Uh, there's a mention of crypto and food commodities in your Inflation Nation article. Thoughts on gold and silver? You know, I'm, I'm kind of getting to, you know, with the number of questions I'm getting about inflation and all the headlines about inflation, I, we, we may be near peak inflation for this cycle. And I know that's a bold call, uh, and I'm not going to bet any big money on that. But um, I think that while half of it's, uh, certainly going to be uh, persistent wages, etc. You, you don't lower them after you raise them. I think a lot related to the supply chain bottlenecks is going to prove to be transitory. And with the Baltic dry rolling over, which we covered last week, uh, I think a lot of, we'll, we'll go into a more comprehensive art, uh, explanation in a few minutes in our article of the week. But it's interesting he brings up gold and silver. So I said, hi, Jeff, good question. We only buy productive assets mostly companies that have pricing power were agnostic on metals, no strong view either way. Now, I will say I pulled up gold and I pulled up silver. Technically, they look okay, but I, I wouldn't put any, I personally wouldn't put any money and I wouldn't put any clients money in gold. And the reason is, um, you know, Buffett made a great case in the annual meeting in 2018 where he compared, you know, he bought his first stock in 1942 and he said that if I put ten thousand dollars in the S and P five hundred in 1942, by 2018, when the annual meeting was, he would have fifty one million dollars. So that ten thousand dollars compounded, like what I'm telling you about, you know, buy an S and P ETF uh, and let it compound tax efficient. Obviously, you'll pay money on the dividends, but um, 
So he'd have 51. If he took that exact same $10,000 in 1942 and put it into gold, uh, that $10,000 would be worth about $400,000. So the fact of the matter is putting in $10,000 into the S&P 500, a group of America's best businesses versus $10,000 in gold. If you chose gold, on the one hand, you turned $10,000 into $400,000. On the other hand, you lost $50.6 million of gains by using gold as an inflation hedge versus stocks as an inflation hedge. And I don't need to tell you the amount of inflation we had since 1942 to 2018. You know, through uh, the Volcker period, through the 70s, through the 60s, through the 50s, uh, through the 80s and 90s, early 90s, we had a, a bout of inflation. Uh, and then we had deflation over the last 20 years. But um, uh, that's why I would never touch it. I, I, I only focus on productive assets. Um, you know, that's not that's not popular right now. Everyone's going into speculative, non-productive assets that they, they think they'll, they'll be able to flip to someone else that's willing to pay more at some point in the future. And that that's just a different game. That's just guessing and, and hoping for the best. Um, but uh, so, so to, to answer Jeff's question, it's a good question. I have no view. If you put a gun to my head, buy or sell metals, short term, maybe I'd be a buyer, but uh, I, I would never even play the game because uh, there's there's no edge and the money, it's not the highest and best use of the capital. So I'm going to leave that one aside. Uh, great question, though, and thanks for, uh, for reaching out. Um, okay, so we know that the infrastructure package got passed uh, $1 trillion. Uh, just a quick couple of things where it's going. Roads, bridges, and transit. $40 billion for bridges. That's good. It seems a little low out of a trillion dollars. Uh, 17.5 billion for complex major projects. Uh, that sounds ambiguous. 11 towards transportation safety programs, trains, uh, 66 billion for rail, 22 billion for Amtrak, 24 billion for the Northeast Corridor, 12 billion for intercity rail, uh, 2.5 billion for zero emission buses, 2.5 billion for low emissions buses, 2.5 billion for ferries, 7.5 billion for uh, electric charging stations. We saw the charging stocks go up. It'd be interesting to look at their market caps relative to the amount of money that the government's putting into it. I, I would imagine it's some ridiculous multiple. In other words, they're getting seven and a half billion. They're probably now all valued at like 75 billion. And, and you're just like, how does that work? <laughs> but nonetheless, uh, it is what it is. Um, so this is the hard and fast and 65 billion for high speed broadband broadband internet, which is kind of interesting because a lot of the uh, broadband providers have really been trading in the gutter like Altice. Um, Comcast got hit recently. I haven't looked at it in a little while. Um, Charter, etc. So that's kind of interesting that all that money's coming and those are, are those are trading weak. Obviously, some of them have multiple businesses that are a drag, but uh, something to, to keep an eye on. And then grid modernization, $65 billion, so the utilities could benefit from that. Shifting right along, speaking about buying what's out of favor, uh, this chart from Bloomberg really stuck out. And I think we're in this kind of period. So uh, this is the ratio between emerging market stocks relative to U.S. equities are now at a 20-year low. Um, and I think that represents an opportunity. When you look at the weighting, the last time they were this low was uh, the early 2000s, and it, it preceded a huge run from you know 2002 to 2007. Uh, that was also a rising rate environment. Uh, starting in 2003, they started raising short rates. Um, so I, I think we're going to see a similar repeat. The key is getting the bottom. So we're, we're just leaning into company by company uh, those companies that we believe have a large margin of safety that are going to be doubles or triples in coming years. Uh, namely, our biggest one is obviously Alibaba because China makes up you know close to 40% of the emerging market index. And then, as we said last week, we were tiptoeing into Turkey, which is up about 10% uh, since, and, uh, and tiptoeing into Brazil. Uh, those are the areas where we see huge amount of uh, value, obviously, you know, governmental chaos is creating that value, but 
that's always what creates the value in emerging markets and then it gets resolved and we're going to talk about resolution in china there have been some major developments this week that we've been waiting for and been talking about and now are, are starting to play out uh, before we do that I want to talk about the labor force participation rate since we're going to reference it this uh week carl quintanilla put out a note from luthold group uh, if in the balance of this recovery, the labor force rises by the smallest amount of any post-war recovery, i.e. 1980. You can see all of these labor force um, participation gains. Uh, the smallest one was uh, the early 80s at 2.5%. If we move just, and most of them you can see here are between you know mid-single digits uh, to mid-teens. So the mean is probably around 9%. But... Um, if we grew at just the 2.5, that would top out at 168.7 million people, which is 7 million more people in the labor force than there are today. Uh, so I wouldn't, you know, everyone's worried about labor force participation rate and getting back to full employment. I think if we just revert back at the lowest possible level post-recession, which we had last year, uh, that's going to take care of itself. And why does that matter? It matters because that's going to bring a huge supply of labor onto the workforce, which means employers are not going to have to bid up so much to get labor, and the wage inflation is going to stop going up. And that's why one of the reasons why we're not so uh, pulling our hair out, about, scared about hyperinflation, uh, is because a supply of labor is coming on, the bottlenecks are com coming off to uh, handle the goods, the uh, labor supply as as the COVID pill, the vaccinations, people get back to work, childcare comes back on board, women can get back now that their kids are back in school full time, uh, and the unemployment benefits have rolled off in September. That's why we saw a good jobs report in October. As we anticipate, we're going to see another great one in November. So, um, so it's reason to be positive. Uh, what is this? Uh, I must have missed that. Okay. A uh, couple things on Boeing. Uh, Boeing's making progress. As we said, you know, we've been big on Boeing and Baba uh, and Cigna. Uh, Boeing is uh, had a couple things resolved this week. First off, they are going to compensate the Ethiopian Airlines 737 MAX crash. That'll be the last kind of factor to put that in the rearview mirror. Uh, so that was positive to see today. That Once that's quantified, the market can look through it. They also, shareholders reached a settlement in the 737 MAX board oversight of $225 million. Boeing was up a little bit on that in the last few days. And then what's the big deal? The big deal, as we said, is going to be when China recertifies the 737 MAX. Then that would be a function of thawing relations between Biden and Xi, which is starting to happen this week uh, with a virtual meeting on Monday. So the summit that was scheduled to take place in Q4 is happening on Monday. That was just announced today. Uh, so that could be a catalyst for positive things. And hopefully one of the key things that will be discussed is removing that um, grounding of the 737 MAX in China. And there's no reason for it to stay down because it's been uh, recertified in many countries, obviously the US included, India, Etc. So once China does that, I think I, I would defy you to see a an ungrounding of the 737 Max in China and not see the stock go up 25 to 30 percent over the following month. Uh, I think it's going to be a huge short squeeze, and I think that's going to be the catalyst. Whether Monday is uh, the day that it gets announced or it's discussed and the relationship thaws and it happens in coming weeks. But I do think that will be a Q4 catalyst, and, uh, and, and we continue to like Boeing quite a bit. Um, okay, uh, this is from Barron's. Inflation was supposed to kill margins. Why companies are turning higher profits anyway? We discussed that uh, margins are actually at the second highest level in history. Everyone came into earnings saying margins were going to be terrible. We came into earnings telling you that they were going to pass it through to customers, and that's exactly what happened. Uh, Royal Caribbean CEO says the worst is behind us. That's uh, He's talking about travel and leisure, which is going to just boom uh, in the next six to nine months. And then uh, now moving uh, on to China. This was really interesting. 
This is from Hedgemine on Twitter, and I looked it up in the SEC filings. Uh, there's a $5 billion hedge fund in London called Boussard and Gav uh, Gavidon that has uh, two former Goldman Sachs guys run it. They just filed that um, they increased their Alibaba holdings by 21 million shares, 21.6 million shares, the ADR, and what that equates to is it this one position is now 88% of their $5 billion portfolio, meaning they have such high conviction in Alibaba that Four billion of their five billion dollar portfolio is now in Alibaba. I think that's certainly high conviction. I, you know, um, God bless them. I think they're going to be they're right, right and they're going to double their portfolio. But that's that's an awful lot to put into one company in terms of portfolio management, et cetera. If you look at most mutual funds, their top positions are two and a half or three position three percent. Uh, hedge funds, you know, high conviction are you know ten or twenty percent. Uh, that's got to be like ridiculously pound the table high. But uh, you know, these, these are um, this is a serious commitment, and you're just seeing more and more smart money. Obviously, you know, Munger doubled down, and a number of others we've covered in recent weeks. So, so we like that, and it's just patience. It's going back to the quote: uh, a lot of people with high IQs are terrible investors because they've got terrible temperaments. They don't have the patience. Uh, and these guys certainly do. So uh, kudos to see that. Um, okay. China G, this has also happened this week, which I think has created the space for him to ease up a lot on his heavy handed regulatory tactics leading up to what happened in the last 24 hours, which was uh, China G is allowed to remain president for life as term limits are removed. China has approved the removal of the two-term limit on the presidency, effectively allowing Xi Jinping to remain in power for life. So that happened in the last 24 hours. Uh, so the Congress next year will be um, um, just uh, more symbolic than, than an actual vote. Uh, and what you're seeing in the face of that is his ability to now ease back on some of his heavy-handed policies of the last four or five months. Uh, first thing that you saw happen in that after that vote uh, giving him lifetime power was that Xi is expected to invite Biden to the Beijing Winter Olympics. That's kind of extending an olive branch. Uh, China weighs moderating property curbs to help troubled developers unload assets in the last 24 hours. Um, this is also from the Wall Street Journal. China's plan to manage Evergrande. Take it apart slowly. We discussed that a month ago. We told you they were going to break it up into three parts and pretty much nationalize it, pay off the RMB denominated debt and screw the USD uh, denominated debt. We still think that's going to be the play. And now um, these type of articles are catching up to that. Uh, Chinese property tax jump. Chinese property and tech stocks jump on hope of softer regulations. This also came out today following that vote. Uh, shares in China property developers booked their best two-day gain in six, six years, joined by a group jump in technology stocks. As investors speculated, Beijing may soften regulatory crackdowns on the two industries. Uh, ba -ba -ba. Optimism spread to technology shares after Reuters reported that Didi Global is preparing to reintroduce its apps in China by the end of the year as regulators wrap up investigations into the ride-hailing company. Uh, that is a big deal um, because it, it's in line with what that other regulator said that we covered a few weeks ago where he said that it was basically winding down. Uh, if you remember, they right after the Didi IPO, they shut down the app. No new people could sign up for their, uh, it's the equivalent of Uber in China. And now it looks like they're getting ready to ramp that back up. That is a big deal because they came out with their IPO like on the wrong day. There was some big Chinese political thing happening and they came out the same day and it pissed off the government. So the fact, if that's true, that they're letting them back in the game, that'll be positive. 
The other thing is prior to the vote giving Xi unlimited uh, lifetime power, uh, she was kind of giving the cold shoulder to the COP26 meeting and the climate change meetings at the G7, etc. cetera. Uh, now they came out, China jointly pledges with the U.S. to step up efforts to fight climate change at COP26. So big about face there. This is all in the last 24 hours, folks. Uh, okay, so this was the Reuters article exclusive. DD prepares to relaunch apps in China. Anticipates data probe will end soon from sources. Uh, the data probe applies to all tech companies. So this would be very, very positive uh, if that's perceived to be winding down. New data law. Uh, bah, bah, bah. Uh, the new personal information protection law states that the handling of information must have a clear and reasonable purpose, lays out conditions under which the companies can collect personal data, and offers guidelines for ensuring data is protected when it's transferred outside the country. So, um, in particular, China has instructed its technology giants to provide more secure storage of user data amid public complaints about mismanagement and misuse that may have resulted in privacy violations. So I think, you know, over the last few months, a lot of these tech companies have probably provided information to the government saying we are now in compliance with the new uh, people law, personal information protection law, and this could potentially wind down over the next four weeks. And it looks like DD is getting ready for that, which is a huge breakthrough. Uh, U.S. Chinese listed education companies jump on report of tutoring licensing coming back. So there will be, uh, I think there's still going to be limitations for kids, but they're going to reissue licenses so they can tutor adults and kids during the specified time period. Uh, and adults are basically learning English is, the, is what they're tutoring. And then you saw 10 cent earnings today post better than expected 3% jump in Q3 net profit. Um, they are, uh, they've got a huge back backlog of video games. They are waiting for um, the government now to let them get back into uh, issuing these new video games, and, and they're ready for that. They, they said as much on the uh, conference call. Uh, here's another one. Alibaba and JD rise on Singles Day. Black Friday in China was a success. So... Um, We'll get more updated information. This is from Rui Ma from about an hour ago. Alibaba just just reported singles day of 84.5 billion in gross merchandise value. That's up 14% for uh, over last year. JD was up 30% over last year. That's 139 billion dollars uh, in gross merchandise value uh, just for singles day which starts a few days before the 11th, today's single stay the 11th. Um, but to put that in perspective, JD and Baba did 139 billion in this short period. The entire US e-commerce did $434 billion for the whole year in 2020. So 139 billion from two companies in a few days versus 434 billion from all the companies in the US for the whole year. And people are wondering, who oh, should I buy Alibaba? I don't know, you know, let me think about it. And meanwhile, the, the, the retail is not even the story. The story is the cloud growth. Uh, and that's expanding well outside the boundaries of China, in Europe, uh, they're becoming, their, their AWS equivalent uh, is growing faster than AWS and is is growing internationally as well. But this was nice to see. Um, the other thing to keep in mind, this table here is from Bank of America, and it shows that institutional client selling tends to peak in October, even though retail client selling, uh, this is from Bank of America Securities, uh, peaks in December. So in other words, institutions which control the vast majority of capital sell most of their losers off uh, by the end of November by the end of October and and that's when you start to see new money come come into those names that were laggards in early parts of the year into the end of the year because the end of year performance chases on and if you're you know underweight and you came into Q3 earnings short or in cash, which many people did because they were all worried about margins, which we said wouldn't be an issue because it would be passed through to the customer. Um, then uh, you you can't you you know the smart ones aren't chasing what's already up 20%. They're trying to find those things that have already sold off uh, and can have big rallies into year end. So um, so so this is this is pretty constructive. Uh, viewpoint from Bank of America. Um, 
And then this just gives you a visual. Alibaba's November 11 sales have surpassed the busiest U.S. online spree. This was as of 2022. So look at Alibaba's singles day last year. And just a mat and that's relative to Black Friday, Cyber Monday in the U.S. The black line is uh, Black Friday, Cyber Monday. So... So it was that much, it was basically double. The one company Alibaba last year was more than double. Yeah, considerably more than double. It looks like 35 billion to 78 billion. Um, and that was 2020. And Alibaba was up another 14% this year. And last year was going to be hugely difficult comps because of the, them coming out of the pandemic and all the pent up demand. So last year was like a huge year for them to beat it by another 14% this year and leave Black Friday, Summer, Cyber Monday. It just shows you the magnitude. Again, two companies doing 139 billion in a few days versus the whole of the US e-commerce doing 434 billion last year. It tells you that these franchises can't be replicated. And when you can buy them at 50% off intrinsic value, you know, it makes sense. And for some funds like the $5 billion fund in London uh, run by the two uh, Goldman Sachs alum, uh, it makes a lot of sense, so much so that they put 80% of their portfolio in it, which is just, yeah, that's a lot. <laughs> that's, a, that's a lot. I mean, I think they're going to be right, but but if they're wrong, I mean, that, you know. Number one thing I learned from from the first, head, at the first hedge fund I worked for was uh, never let, he, he said to me, I'll never let them carry me out in a stretcher. And, you know, 80% in one name, you know, that that's, that's a lot. Uh, they'll probably be right, but, you know that that you could wind up in a stretcher with that kind of <laughs> conviction, but uh, to each his own. I, I think it's a pretty safe bet. But you know, with, with your own money, you could do that. With outside money, uh, no way. Uh, okay, so just to give you an update on what's happening here, this is Alibaba it was up thirty percent in a couple of weeks in October. Then it retraced, did a 50% retracement. Now it's bouncing off of that. It looks like it wants to push to, to new highs. We've got earnings coming up on the 18th. So uh, hopefully that will be positive along with some of the US-China thawing on Monday. Uh, and that's that. So our article of the week is the Inflation Nation Stock Market and Sentiment Results. Um, that came out this morning for the first time since Chair Powell announced taper last Wednesday. The treasury market behaved as one would expect. Yields were up on the 10-year treasury and long duration earnings stocks, high multiple tech names were down. You could see it here. Energy names were also down after reporting a 1 million barrel build and headlines recording the nuclear Iran nuclear deal talks were ubiquitous. We've been talking about that for a while. Uh, Iran wants US assurances that it will never abandon nu nuclear deal if it's revived. So they're basically saying, We'll come back to the table. We'd like to do a deal, but you can't, you know, if you change administrations, you can't walk it back. Um, otherwise, it's not worth us talking. So my guess is they'll get some type of assurance and that'll get worked out over time. If successful, an Iran deal would add 400 to 500,000 barrels a day to global supply. Uh, that would be short term negative, but demand is now above pre pandemic levels. So. Um, it would just be a short-term shakeout of all the late money trying to buy energy now after it's up huge. Got to shake those out. That could be the catalyst. And then we'll, we'll definitely uh, have a positive three to five years um, moving forward. Uh, the catalyst for the move higher in yields yesterday was higher than expected inflation numbers. This, you know, it's interesting. The CPI numbers were worse than expected. They came in higher than expected. Uh, CPI was up 6.2% year on year. But the PPI numbers, the producer price index, was actually below expectations the day before. So it's kind of a mixed bag, but this took people by surprise because it was the highest number in 30 years since the early 90s, which also proved to be a peak in inflation. Um, I do think the counter trend move following last week's taper announcement was more structural, short covering and liquidations than fundamental. So if you see since last week, the 10 year yield actually went down after the announcement of taper. Um, as we've repeatedly pointed out in our recent podcast and video cast, managers were all on one side of the boat, i.e. they were all short bonds and many experienced pain in recent weeks following the moves from central bankers. This showed uh, in the last Bank of America Global Fund Manager survey. A uh, net percent of investors saying they were overweight bonds was at the lowest in history. Uh, it was negative 80%. Um, and then you see the four articles of, of the uh, funds that are blowing up because they were all 
super leveraged short bonds and and they did the same thing so i think what this was was a short covering move um when they didn't get what they want and they got margin calls uh this was a structural dislocation and then that played out and uh now yields are working a, a bit higher um as we laid out the price retreats we are seeing among a broad range of commodities soybeans corn lumber milk lean hogs etc will show up on a lagged basis in coming months reports until then you'll see prominent non-economists stoking fears about hyperinflation uh, here are the data points that the hyperinflationistas will lean on number one they'll say the year-on-year -year change in inflation was the highest since 1990 we see it here that was the last peak they'll say the five-year break-even uh, inflation rate which represents a measure of inf inspected inflation derived from the five-year treasury constant maturity securities and five-year treasury inflation index constant maturity securities. The latest value implies what market participants expect inflation to be in the next five years on average. It's now at 3.08%. I think that's fine, I, and, I, and I think that's accurate. Uh, I do think we're going to get above trend, but I don't think we're going to get runaway or hyper. Um, they'll also point to the Fed balance sheet has doubled since the beginning of the pandemic and will add another $660 billion during the taper period between now and June. They'll also say M2 money supply has gone parabolic since the beginning of the pandemic, up 37.9% uh, since March 2020. And they'll say that money market fund balances are at all-time highs. So the argument goes, inflation is when too much money is chasing too few goods. We're seeing some of that in the short term as the supply chain bottlenecks limit supply. We're seeing wage inflation due to lower supply of labor. Uh, that's due to labor force participation rate, which we covered last week and which we referenced earlier in this call, saying why we think that's going to change uh, relatively quickly. The key question is, what would have to happen for the hyperinflation camp to be right? And the answer is velocity of money would have to pick up material. So materially. So what is velocity of money? You can see this table right here. It peaked in 1995 and it's just collapsed ever since and it's at historic all-time lows. So what's happening that the velocity of money is collapsing? The definition is it's the frequency at which one unit of currency is used to purchase domestically produced goods and services within a period, given period of time. In other words, it's the number of times $1 is spent to buy goods and service per unit of time. If the velocity of money is increasing, then more transactions are occurring between individuals in an economy. While the first half of the equation is there, we certainly do have too much money and we have printed a lot of money. The last half is not chasing too few goods. The shortage of goods will be temporary and we're already seeing a shift from purchase of goods to purchases of services, soon to be travel and leisure explosion, in my opinion. Now, this is the CPI numbers, and you can see the biggest numbers year on year is fuel oil, gasoline, and energy, and that's a self-inflicted wound from closing down drilling on federal lands. There's no secret about that. That was a policy-inflicted bump, and the vast majority of the inflation is relative to that. So potentially the Iran deal, this administration probably has an incentive to do that, which will add another 500,000 barrels, will mitigate this rise in the short term. But I, I do see oil staying relatively elevated, uh, you know, for the next handful of years, probably in a range of, you know, 55 to 95. Uh, I, I don't think we're going to see crashes below 50 again. Uh, and maybe you'll even see a hundred dollar handle, you know, for a few spikes uh, as they're working through this transition. Used cars and trucks came down. Remember, it spiked in June at 10.5 percent year on year. It was up 2.5 percent, and there's still a shortage. So, really, where you're seeing all this inflation that everyone's worried about is in fuel oil, gasoline, energy commodities, and you know, energy services across the board. Uh, and that's self-inflicted. We could change that if we wanted to. So. Uh, so if we're seeing an inflation in goods, energy, and wages, but nowhere in proportion to the percentage of money created over the last 20 months, i.e. inflation is not 37%, despite the fact that we've increased the money supply by 37.9%, where's all the money going? All the money is going into assets. It's going into the stock market, it's going into real estate, and it's going into non-productive assets like savings, money markets, commodities, including gold and silver, uh, crypto and NFTs and art, uh, until that changes, the calls for hyperinflation are unfounded. 
That said, we do believe the five-year break-evens are realistic, and we could certainly see above-trend inflation, not hyper or runaway for years to come. 3% inflation versus 2% inflation we've struggled with for two decades. This will be driven by 72 million millennials, average age 30, starting housing formation and family formation, which drives spending, just as we saw in the last two younger population boom periods of 1982 to 2000 and 1948 to 1968. It'll be partially offset by the deflationary effect of technology and automation, um, and uh, above trend, not runaway inflation is good for the economy because it ignites animal spirits. Over the past two decades, there was little incentive to buy many goods as there was no fear of loss to act now due to prices rising in the future. Also, businesses were more reluctant to invest. They, instead, they bought back shares because they didn't have the flexibility to raise prices. We're seeing the second highest margins in history for Q3 earnings seasons, just knocking on the door of 13%. As companies are passing through their higher costs, we talked about this over the summer when everyone is saying, I, yeah, I said, just give them another quarter and boom, now it's happening. They're passing it through. People feel a bit better because their wages are going up and employers have to compete for their labor. That's going to change soon as well. Uh, the economic story to carry us through 2022 will be CapEx spending by businesses, which were delayed as businesses hunkered down for a depression in 2020, and inventory rebuilding as inventories are still at depression levels. Both will be positive for the economy. You can see CapEx slowly rising, and you can see inventories are still in the tank, uh, not this low since 2009. So uh, this is going to be a huge opportunity, and you can see it a different view here. Rates. We're in a tricky situation as it relates to rates. While I've previously said that we expected the 10-year yield to move to 2 to 2.5% before taper, and that would likely be the peak in the 10-year yield for the cycle, like happened in December 2013, when they announced taper, the peak of 170 basis points reached before the announcement last week seems a little low for the cycle peak. Uh, you can see the 10-year constant maturity. So for those who think the Fed can't allow rates to go up because we have too much debt and the interest payments are too high, you're partially right. We do have too much debt for sure, but we'll likely inflate and grow down this debt to GDP ratio over time. Uh, as for interest payments on debt as a percentage of GDP, we're now on the low end of the 30 year uh, of the 80 year range depicted below. So the amount of GDP that we're spending on interest is much lower than it was in the 80s and 90s and in the 40s uh, and early 50s. Despite Chair Powell not following his own guidance to prioritize full employment before announcing taper, it is still a priority for him, provided he still keeps his job. As I mentioned earlier, Lael Brainerd was also interviewed for the job this week, and she's known to be more dovish than Powell, i.e. she might slow down taper and rate hike expectation. If Powell stays, he still has to he still has some work to do if he wants to get the unemployment rate down to the pre-pandemic levels, which would imply delaying rate hikes as long as he possibly can, provided the supply chain issues start to clear and bring down prices and labor supply comes back on and, and moderates wage increases. So you can see that here. Right now, the Fed fund futures are pricing in two rate hikes in 2022, followed by three in 2023. I think this is too uh, aggressive. I don't think we're going to see that fast, but we'll see. Uh, if the Fed fund futures are correct, they will invert the curve and cause a recession by 2023. The curve has already started to flatten materially. This is the ratio of the two-year yield to the 10-year yield. It's come down quite a bit, just like it did in 2011. While I believe this recent move is a head fake caused by structural de-risking de de from hedge funds caught off sides and crowded to one side of the boat, everyone was short bonds. If the Fed moves too fast, they will invert the curve and end the cycle too soon. The more likely scenario, despite the premature taper announcement, is that the Fed slow plays rate raises and lets the curve re-steepen and stay steep, just like you saw here and here, uh, for another couple of years before starting to end the cycle. You can see there were a couple of fake outs early in the last cycle as well, 2011 and 2012, but the curve re-steepened and stayed steep until 2014. The move toward inversion took another five years after that from 2014 to 2019, and then, of course, we got the recession about six months later. Uh, now on to the shorter-term view for the general market. If you're on the podcast, you're going to get cut off in 45 seconds. Just go to hedgefundtips.com, click on the video cast. You forward the YouTube video to minute 60, and you'll pick up word for word right where you left off, and you can watch the last handful of minutes. Um, what we're seeing in sentiment is that uh, it's getting ebullient and exuberant, certainly among the retail crowd. Uh, AAII sentiment hit 48%. Um, 
and that's bullish percent 24 percent bearish so we're getting closer to extremes obviously this can extend a little higher as we've seen in past instances but the risk reward uh, uh equation is changing the cnn fear and greed is at 82 which is also uh, massive greed and um Green is back. You can cautiously ride existing risk if you own, if you own reasonably valued businesses. But it is not a time to add a lot of new risk or high beta stocks at these levels. You can learn how this indicator is calculated, how it works here. And finally, the National Association of Active Investment Managers uh, uh, Equity Exposure Index rose to. Actually, I have the more updated one here. Uh, it dropped from 107 and change to 103 and change. So they chased up. They've taken a little off uh, last week, probably yesterday when you had that inflation scare. Uh, and we'll see if they stay elevated with the year end chase or if they come in before taking another move back up. Um, but uh, that was that. Whether the 10 year yield moves to 2 to 2.5% as I anticipated, or the lower probability event that yields peaked with the premature taper announcement like in 2013. It doesn't change our view on equities for 2022. Volatility will increase. The 3 to 5% corrections of 2021 will turn into 5 to 10% plus corrections in 2022 as liquidity is slowly removed. However, until they invert the curve, the two-year yield becomes greater than the 10-year yield. The general trajectory for equities will be up despite increased volatility. The volatility will just create more opportunity to capture under the surface sector rotation and dislocation opportunities, which is our knitting. So that's that. Um, and then finally, we've got, uh, we saw some unusual activity late last week in Boeing. Someone bought 20,000 contracts, 2 million share equivalent of Boeing 255 call options for December expiration. So they think this is going to be, and they paid two and a half dollars. So they think this is going to be well above $260 before December 17th. Uh, and I can certainly see that if, if we get a catalyst, if we get the ungrounding of the 737 in China, maybe off of a positive meeting on Monday and in the next couple of weeks, uh, that's, that's certainly realistic. And it was interesting to see that big block come in. Uh, earnings, um, by and large, have been good. 89% uh, have now reported. The big thing that we saw in earnings was that uh, estimates finally went up again. So they've been flatlining since August 15th at around 219, 220 area. And just in the last week, they shot up to 221.29. We think these are going to move up to 230 before the end of the year, which will make the multiple look a lot more reasonable. Uh, and you also saw 220 estimates, 221 estimates, 2021 estimates have hockey sticked higher. Uh, they thought that they were going to be $200 going into earnings. They're actually closer to 205, 204.78. So we've seen that big gain on 2021. We haven't seen the big hockey stick yet on 2022, but I think that will be coming. And to give you an idea, 81% of the company S&P has reported, I'm sorry, 89% have reported results. 81% have reported uh, better than expected earnings, 75% better than expected revenues. And the growth rate, if you remember when it was, 27 percent 27 and a half percent going into earnings i said it would it could pass it would be above 35 it could possibly be a 40 handle uh it's now at 39.1 percent so we may get over 40 before all the companies have reported uh and that would be positive and margins i think are still at uh just under 13 percent which would be the second highest in history uh despite that fear going into earnings uh just a quick look at some of the economic numbers this week uh, as I said, the PPI uh, was better than the CPI. The PPI came in below expectations, so producer input costs uh, were a little better. The CPI uh, was not as good, and we have isolated that to largely related to energy costs, uh, which you saw in the data that we just went over. Uh, there was the build in oil inventories. Today was a holiday, and tomorrow we'll see jolts and consumer sentiment. Uh, and rig count. So you can look forward to that. And that's it for the week. So I want to thank everyone for listening in. Uh, we'll be back next week, same time, same place. In the meantime, make it a great one. Bye for now.